Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Thank you, all of you, for being here. So um, Claire is going to show like a PowerPoint and give us a rundown on the actual exhibition. But I would like to just share a few words. So I was thinking that um, it was, though it seems that the book took a very long time in making, <laughs> but it was actually March of 2015 that when I was given the award by the Asia Society Hong Kong on contributions to contemporary art, I, act, I was at the site itself. And when, um, when I saw the building, I was taken in by the actual architecture and its history. So a former explosives magazine compound built by the British Army in the mid-19th century for explosives and ammunition production and storage, it had been reimagined by Todd William and Billy Sen, architects, <coughs> in a deeply profound manner. The layers of its past life were around, keeping one's awareness of history always present. The site had served as housing for British soldiers between 1843 and 1846, and later it was transformed into a production and processing plant for artillery. I felt an immediate connection to the space and its context via the works I had been making in recent years, particularly the last post, which was done in 2010, and Parallax in 2013, that examined trade, corporate enterprise, as well as modes of circulations of objects, ideas, and examined through such contexts in terms of how meaning is always in flux. The protagonist in my work, the East India Company man, is precisely the official who would have once lived there. If there's time, perhaps we can show an, a clip of the animation. What unfolded soon afterwards was a wonderful collaboration with the Asia Society and the Hong Kong community. And I'll let Claire do more of the um, thank yous, personal thank yous. Thank you so much, Shazia, who we all need to thank very much for being so willing to be involved in this exhibition all the way through and being so generous with her words and with her work. Um, thank you so much to Rachel Cooper, to Boon Hui Tan, and uh, everyone else here at Asia Society in New York for hosting this event. Uh, thank you so much for the generous support of Ali and Amna Nakfi, who are indispensable to the realization of this exhibition. In the Asia Society Hong Kong, uh, Alice Mong and Ronnie Chan for their leadership and direction and uh, unparalleled support for this exhibition. Uh, to Winsome Tam and Pauline Wong, who made um, exhibitions like this um, possible and all of the programming that they did and supported. We had uh, public programming with Bishir Ahmad, uh, Shazia's teacher from Pakistan, who came to Hong Kong for a miniature painting workshop. And thank you also to Diyan, uh, the composer who did the uh, soundtrack for The Last Post and Parallax, both of the animations in the exhibition. Most of all, thank you to Dominique Chen and Ashley Wu. Uh, Dominique is the uh, head of exhibitions at the Asia Society and who was uh, extremely supportive from every aspect of this exhibition, and especially Ashley, who was very involved uh, with the catalog as well. So those two had a, a wonderful role and we're very thankful for their uh, involvement with the project. And then for the book, uh, the graphic designers here in New York with projects uh, helped in the sort of the beginning initial conception of the graphic design and then UBC and Zero in Hong Kong over the past few months uh, we worked very closely closely with them as this uh, book came to fruition thank you to the authors uh, in this catalog Nick Robbins John Saylor Ayad Akhtar Hans Ulrich Abrist and also to Shazia for sharing uh, we hope you all read it her wonderful artist statement um, I just wanted to say something about the Asia Society as an institution also and thank them and also take a moment to realize the kind of institution that this is, that um, to have an exhibition in Hong Kong for a Pakistani artist and then be able to also host a uh, book launch here in New York really speaks to the support for transnational artists working in contemporary art practice these days and how few institutions, um, I can't even think of another one who could do such a thing such as this. So I think it really speaks to the nature of the Asia Society as an institution as a plat and as a platform. Shazia had a show here in 2001. 
and, uh, and she was able to have an exhibition in the Hong Kong site as well. So sort of showing two different contexts for a transnational artist is unique to the institution's format. Um, so the book that you're all going to see this evening at once echoes the format of the exhibition, but is also uh, independent of it. So I wanted to just go ahead and show, begin by talking a little bit about um, the format of the show and show you a few images. So here you see the, um, the former explosive magazine compound. And then there was a satellite exhibition at the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, which is a former ferry terminal. Uh, the former terminal of the Star Ferry that literally extends out into the ocean, as you can see. So the animations were both shown here as well as at the Asia Society site. Uh, so here are some installation shots. We had a wonderful photographer from the Asia Society, Scott Brooks, who took some of these photographs of the show, um, which are included in the uh, book as well. So the uh, exhibition was organized in four chambers, so that sort of echoed the architecture of the space. And each chamber had a thematic uh, and conceptual underpinning, which was named after, and this is some images of the first chamber. Uh, and I chose to use Shazia's own words to title each of the chambers. So they're each given the title for one of the works in that room. So the title of this first room, this first room was A Sight and Pleasing Dislocation, which is the image on the cover of the catalog. And then the second room, um, I am exact, the exact imitation of the original, uh, which you see right here, has to do with the idea of uh, copying and the process of creating a likeness of something and the uh, complications and complexity inherent in the process of creating uh, a likeness. So maybe, Shazia, you could talk a little bit about how you see that process working in terms of both your work in portraiture and uh, larger scale works. Um, so here's a few more images of work from that room. Well, I think for me what is um, <clears throat> most interesting is that right now this particular body of work, I'm able to um, have a sense of looking back. Mm -hmm. And in that process, like the glance backward to move forward mm -hmm. is what the, why this exhibition as well as the book now seems even much more uh, necessary mm -hmm. because that seems to be the current mood of where I am and the current mood in general around me. So for that, um, I thought it was very inventive mm -hmm. how you explored and um, uh, split up the exhibition into these thematic zones. And, um, you know, um, other than the idea of copying, it's not a literal idea. It's more how do you insert yourself or your engagement with tradition into tradition? Mm -hmm. The notion of tradition is so truncated. And how do you how do you create a sense of ownership? It's not just about taking something and um, copying it or appropriating it. What is that process that allows you an ownership? It's not necessarily all about geography either or who's born where. And I think that exploration is something that was an interesting parallel mm -hmm. in terms of portraiture, in terms of um, ritual, in terms of um, rote. Mm -hmm. And so all these ideas get elaborated. So the idea of portraiture is not literal either. Right. You know, uh, it's for me. I've explored it through through multiple ideas. There is the uh, one particular painting that I did in 1999 on many faces of Islam mm -hmm. before September 11th. So it's mm -hmm. very prescient in that so respect. Our, it was in there. It was part of the exhibition mm -hmm. to bring up iconic ideas, iconic works, mm -hmm. and then to allow like space through other ideas around those works and situate them in history was, um, for me as an artist, was, was really exciting to um, participate and shape. Mm -hmm. So um, we can, you can move forward. Um, perhaps we can speak on, yeah. on a particular work. It's also very hard to see the images um, well, on maybe such a we short can speak screen. about this work in particular, Practice Makes Perfect, which was the idea, you, you mentioned the word rote learning and how that relates to copying and uh, the process of creating a likeness or inserting oneself into a tradition. And this as a very sort of humorous and playful title, I think that um, as you'll see many of the works, the titles of the works are incredibly evocative and uh, are a way of kind of entering into the work, not in a comprehensive way, but it's just sort of one angle about getting into 
uh, a work and maybe thinking about how the title informs our reading of it. So do you maybe want to talk a little bit about um, this one? Yeah, um, I think in general, like the large scale drawings, that the, actually you would be able to see them better in the book. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, there is a, the, how I was making that work is very indica indicative of what we're talking to. Uh -huh. It's all like, they are like eight, 10 feet large drawings. Maybe um, some of them are uh, collectively 15, 20 mm -hmm. feet wide. Mm -hmm. And when I'm working, I'm working, um, I'm standing with the work and I'm writing. So the idea of, of repetition or the idea of extending the work through gesture, through thinking through the hand mm -hmm. was all encapsulated, mm -hmm. which is very different than doing a smaller scaled work or, or transforming scale through a digitizing process mm -hmm. where you know the projections can scale it up to 28 meters or more. Mm -hmm. So this idea is not literal that you scale up, but the immensity of space. Mm -hmm. So I think some of, some of that in this exhibition was, was about allowing people to see certain vocabulary mm -hmm. that can exist at, at one level and how it transforms when it's seen through another time, through another medium, through another um, confrontational idea with, with the particular uh, form and imagery also. And I think that that's mm -hmm. how I would think of road too, mm -hmm. that road is a process through many, I, I filter it through the Catholic schooling I went to, through the idea of doing an apprenticeship for many years, also in terms of, um, you know, uh, being able to um, uh, engage memory. Mm -hmm. So understand history, mm -hmm. insert storytelling in history, like redaction. Mm -hmm. All of these issues play on the, at some conceptual level on the, on, on road. And then my approach to it is very investigative. Mm -hmm. So there's that type of um, conflict or tension mm -hmm. that, um, that I think uh, was very, was successful in the experience of the exhibition. Yeah, and you mentioned this change in scale, and that I think you can see quite clearly, even in the experiential component of the exhibition, that these large-scale drawings are installed adjacent to the room where, and here you can see it sort of peeking through the side of where Parallax was on view. So I thought of these large-scale uh, drawings as being very related to the immersive nature, not only literally in terms of scale, but the immersive nature of the animation and a lot of the uh, imagery that's at stake in many of these works. And here we also have, and you can't see them probably very well on the screen, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the process by which the animations are made by drawing. So even though it's a digital technology, drawing is very much at the heart of your work. Yeah. So maybe you can speak a little bit about your relationship to, to yeah, drawing. Yeah. So like uh, how I see drawing is that drawing basically is a thinking tool. It's a way to write it's a way to paint through writing. That's how I see drawing. And like, and if I kind of use that template, then it doesn't even matter what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. It has been a variety of outcomes. So even like um, opening this week uh, at Princeton, I have like my first foray into glass, large scale, 70 foot plus works in glass, which also can be traced down to drawing. Mm -hmm. And um, that sort of was, I mentioned that because it's a new foray into a new medium. But in terms of animation, um, I've been doing animation for several years, for over a decade, but the more ambitious ones, which are multi-channel, they also um, come down to the relationship of the drawn and how that drawing allows different ideas to gel. Mm -hmm. And then um, basically, it's very simple. I draw and I scan, and then different um, stages of the, of the narrative all have, are basically um, uh, all uh, determined through drawing. So very little is uh, left 
on the idea of a software. And I think that's been the foundation for me, is that how to um, n not have drawing be subservient mm -hmm. um, and not to be hijacked by a software. And yet at the same time, complicate the movements in, in, the, in the language of technology mm -hmm. and, um, and complicate them to such a degree that, that it doesn't even matter which software was used, mm -hmm. right? So the simpler, the better. And that's how I see the drawing also, is that it all comes down to the simple idea, but then uh, I'm not afraid of doing as many as I needed mm -hmm. for the, so there were like hundreds and thousands of drawings that fed into a 15 minute piece. Mm -hmm. But um, to be able to share that piece, for example, at the Hong Kong um, Maritime Museum, and not just that, that that particular work has has been traveling. Mm -hmm. It's in Rome right now, and it will. Um, it's gone to many different parts of the world. That facility of that medium is exciting. Mm -hmm. It's easy to send. It's easy to share. Um, it's also there's this breaking of the preciousness, which which is kind of similar to when I started doing uh, large scale murals in the mid 90s, mm -hmm. and a lot of the installation works then. So in that sense, it it has that same capacity. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I was trying to find the images of the last post, I, I mean of Parallax, but I think we have them at the end here. So this is just the side view that you're seeing of the exterior of the, um, of the space here with this, this is the annex chamber here. But um, one thing that you mentioned about the animation was this kind of mutability of drawing and how it's allowed you to experiment with, with so many different media. and. Uh, one of the things that goes along with that is the process of, of layering in that medium and how layering works, this layering of drawing and how um, drawing has this capacity to, in, a, in its animated form, to create this other, uh, other depth in the work that you're seeing when you're in the animation. And that's not something that's necessarily distinct from the drawing practice. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how depth and form work on the surface of a work on paper or the or the page. Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, materiality mm -hmm. is essential. So I'm an artist, a visual artist. So um, how the the type of paint to the relationship of paint on paper, mm -hmm. paint on surface, the text textual nature of um, of the material as well as the iconographic nature of the forms that are being developed, mm -hmm. um, where they're coming from, how they are being tr transformed, where they will lead. That type, of abil that type of idea of capturing, connecting the past and present to the future mm -hmm. is, is not just happening in the drawing. Mm -hmm. It's being fed by interest in reading and writing also, but you know, so if I think of that, there is like one is um, filtering so much all yes. the time. And that filter is, is also has to be nuanced and subtle. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think of the pressure of brush on paper, that the, that the interface mm -hmm. of that is going to speak in, it, in its own language. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, of digital, for me, digital was not like just ability to um, change the nature of a, of a drawing as the object, but more in terms of um, um, the vastness, the infinite sense of space, and then with, and learning the technology so that mm -hmm. it's not, it's like the works that I just uh, did uh, at the Philadelphia Art Museum, the animation there, which has just opened a few weeks ago, it's in 4K. It's like the technology is really ahead, it's advanced, it's, it's so you're embracing the technology, but you're not, but you're still championing mm -hmm. the, um, the tenacity of the drawing. Mm -hmm. And I don't see them as separate. I don't see one as a car poorer copy mm -hmm. of, of the drawn. Mm -hmm. And that's been the, the, the kind of interest is how do you, how do you make them separate? Mm -hmm. yet interconnected so they can both be seen um, for unique um, abilities. And I just want to say a few words about how the animations were installed in four different instances in Hong Kong. Uh, the last post, 
which is a 2010 single channel animation, was installed within the uh, theater of the Hong Kong, uh, of the Asia Society Hong Kong. And here you can see the formal, the former railroad tracks in front of the entrance to this building that they used to actually move the explosives from one building to another. Uh, and here you see the, the work installed here. Parallax was installed at the end of the, the main room of the, uh, of the former explosives magazine compound. And here you see a few stills of the work. Uh, and here it is installed in that, in that room. Uh, and then it was also installed in the Maritime Museum in a slightly larger scale. And here you see this, this screen is actually facing out the window, so it's facing on the water. So the, this parallax has a lot of water-related imagery, water as a vector for the movement of commodities, people, objects, and it's a very, um, very layered history. And one of the things we talked about a lot in thinking about this exhibition was the history of the British East India Company and the role of Hong Kong in that history. And Nick Robbins has written an essay, who's a, Nick Robbins is a historian of the British East India Company, and he's written uh, an essay um, in the book about how Hong Kong fits into uh, that history and parallax in particular look deals with a lot of water related iconography and images um, as well as the sky. So, do you want to say anything about um, parallax but, here? Well, I actually what I do want, what I'm understanding as we're talking is I'm thinking so much of my work is image born, right? There's mm -hmm. imagery, it's heavy on forms and images, and all of those images have meaning. So in this type of a <laughs> setup, it's very hard to get into the, the iconography and mm -hmm. elaborate where it's coming from, what it means, and how does it convey its presence and its history. But I think I, I got a chance to look at the book just today, earlier, and a lot of that is very well communicated in the book. So the color uh, quality is good, color templates are good, the chambers and the layout is there, and then the essays talk about it. Also, I've written a, a, a lo <laughs> large uh, uh, essay also on, on many of the images that are prevalent in the work. And I was thinking that perhaps um, um, maybe the image on the cover of the book might be a good image for yeah. us to... And to talk about. And I want to talk a little bit about the, what the title of the book means, too, and, and do so by talking about that image. So the phrase apparatus of power comes from the title of one of Shazia's work. So, but more broadly, that is a concept that has to do with the endless inventiveness of an image or form. So the capacity of a single form to change, transform, mutate over time, and take on different iterations in multiple format or media, and basically have its own life as a visual language. So uh, we chose this form as the signature image of the of the exhibition, but also it's not that it's the only one in the visual vocabulary of images that Shazia has created, but because it has a very um, long life, and it, you can see that at different moments in the book as well. And so this work was created in 1993 when you were a student at, uh, at RISD, and it has taken on um, multiple lives since then. Here it is at 1997, Shazia's first exhibition at the Drawing Center. Um, here it's been uh, painted on the wall and it's much larger. You can't really tell with scale with the size of this painting, but it's a much smaller board. And then finally here it is, um, you know, obviously many more iterations between these are just three examples. This is, um, this is at Doris Duke's Shangri-La in, uh, in 2011 at, uh, in Hawaii, in Honolulu, Hawaii. So Doris Duke in the 1930s had this sprawling home filled with um, an eclectic collection of works from North Africa, the Middle East, South Asia that she collected in her home and now it's a space for artist residency and here Shazia projected this image uh, out at night onto the trees and you can see the ink interacting with the surface of the foliage to create the image that you see here which is actually the back cover of the book. So the idea was the these two kind of different moments about 20 years apart um, and how they've changed changed over in that period of time. Back to the first one. So yeah, so this image, um, you know, when I think of this, when I see this image, the one here, right here in the book, for me, um, when I made this form, I was thinking the 
beheading of the feminine, the removal of the feminine in certain cultures, in certain traditions. And I was tapping into that. And, and when I look at it now, I am still like, um, I think it's still relevant, especially right now in this current situation. And I, I, that's how I saw it. It was called a kind of slight and pleasing dislocation. Because at that time, I was thinking, well, um, Oh, we carry our roots where we go. We, and then it was also about an image which is self-dependent or independent. It's floating. It is, um, it's not necessarily just about the diaspora because it was still very recent. It was two years of being in the country or maybe a year. But I think it had more to do with that. It had a lot to do with the expunging of the female and the in, instinct to dig in that direction, to look for the unfamiliar, the hidden, the, the one that elicits fear. And, to, um, and that's why it doesn't have a head. But it was also looking at the tradition where I come from, where it's so much history of Hindu and Muslim and before Islam and all of those deep layers. So, you know, so, the, so that kind of, um, that is what I, when I think of this image, I'm thinking of the depth of history and and at the same time taking that and using it as a means to come up with forms which were of coming of age and then to revisit that now seems so um, critical and pertinent because this form embodies that and yet I feel like where have we come <laughs> where are we headed we are still in that same moment of um, you know, incredible uncertainty and um, the value of the female. And I, that's how I see it. So I was very, I, personally, I was like, oh, this is actually really great that the launch of the book is happening a few days after the election. And, and I'm also like looking at the choice we made to, to embody the show with this form. And, um, and then this form has appeared in multiple ways throughout my work. It has lent itself not just as a, me, as a lens to look at culture, but also as a vehicle to uh, reflect and absorb. And when, it was, uh, when I projected that at the Doris Duke Foundation, I, I was looking at the kind of the um, arc of somebody you know, I was looking at Doris Duke and her history and how that is also a very interesting cross-section of American Orientalism, what that meant at that time. Plus, we has, you have to understand that it's projected into space. So it's just projected into air and then it lands on foliage and trees and then it, it forms itself and comes into focus. It was a fleeting... It's a fleeting... Um, image and that was my way of of questioning um and um understanding a moment in history again in the 1930s particularly in context to um the site that had the space that had invited me shangri-la so there there it found its way so it's kind of it's found its ways in many many um iterations and and that's why i feel like um very excited to revisit it. So maybe, you know, maybe the next body of work will take much more ownership. Plus, we don't have um, those particular images, but this body of work that I did in the mm -hmm. mid 90s, mm -hmm. so much of it is unpublished because my, I myself was like not very sure how to confront it. So I put it all in storage. And I will just <laughs> say this painting, uh, when I saw it in Shasya's studio, was piled under a stack of paintings. It was not in a frame. So the decision to frame it, and it doesn't have glass over it, it has a thin frame that's very close to the edges, but you can still see the edges of the board, was, um, you know, this I think is the first time that this work was shown, even though it was made um, so long ago. So thank you. That was so well put. And perhaps we should end with a, a little bit of the last post? Sure. Um, we can show a little bit of the animation. Do you want to dim the lights a little?
So now we'd like to open it up to uh, any questions that you may have. Or we can go to the reception. <laughs> or we can go to straight to the reception. So I have a question. Um, Shazi, I'm really interested because this took a, a particular frame. Um, and st as you talked earlier about the apparatus of power, it's such a um, it's such a provocative um, title. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about it. Yeah. So when, um, for me, the apparatus of power is really about the power of imagination. Because what connects all of us? What connects past to present to future? What connects us? What connects me to you guys? I think it, it, for me, I have to believe that it's imagination that we can imagine a better future. We can, we should. We ha it's the responsibility of imagination also, which is so essential. And that's how I thought of it, like that how, you know, how do you embrace imagination, how you, if art for me is an instinct to imagine the future, then imagination becomes powerful. And yet your key um, image is so disturbing. It's what so you have, but see, disturbing. it is. But I think that's what, what I when I think of miniature painting, right? When I became interested in it, I was I was equally aware that it was so poignant, it was so gorgeous and beautiful, but it was also not just um, pretty, you know. And that's the type of power of beauty that I was interested in was the awe of uh, the sublime, the fear of it. The, you know, if I looked at Goya, and then the, 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 the kind of beauty and the horror, and not, not just making a, um, a beautiful, like, you know, beautiful picture. So, so that, beauty is not neutral. Beauty is not neutral at all. And then also, I think beauty in terms of like, you know, as a painter, yes, my language is going to be paint and, and, and the facility of surface and the tenacity of it and how you can p speak through that. So I have to embrace all of it. But at, but, but at the same time, how do you create the tension? 
Thanks, Rachel. Congratulations, Shazia. Just fabulous work. I have a question since you mentioned <coughs> language. Um, you start with several simpler images and then you combine it with technology to make it into a more complex thing. So whenever we move from simplicity towards complexity, certain emergent properties appear. When the brain level uh, reached a certain level of cognition, language evolved. We can't explain the appearance of language. It's an emergent property. I'm just wondering when you start with your images and, um, and then they become more and more complex, are you surprised at any point by something that emerged which was completely unexpected? And how, how are you handling all this? So it's a fantastic question. I think that how I th that the lang it's the the language is so central, uh, but it has to for me the lexicon of the language is also equally important. So to make the first word or to make the first alphabet of sources equally is a very difficult task. So how do you make a a type when you're looking at a variety of um, types present, say, within the miniature space. How do you create the prototype that will evolve into the type that will lead into the archetype, you hope, right? Of course, there's the stereotype, too. So I, that's how I was thinking. Like The stock character within the miniature has profound history, presence, possibility. And how do you how do you imagine that? How do you invent something? And within that, of course, technology or the direction in animation, and I don't really like the word animation. There is no other word out there that I can embrace, but that idea of like movement that's going to then create complexity is basic principle that in conversation with um, Patrick, who I've worked with for many, many years, who helps me with the animation, is that, you know, what happens in nature. Wind is going to move, sky, um, the, the color of the sky is going to change, the flower is going to blossom, you know, the tree is going to grow. So paths that lend naturally to movement will start there. And then we'll try to complicate those to such a degree that they seem real, but they're not. They're, so that's one, one example I would ex share. So. Um, I'll come back. <laughs> um, you have transitioned so far from where you started with your miniature paintings. Did you ever? Can you use the mic? Can you use how the did mic? how did you go through those stages of expanding to where you are now? With the I'm knowledge? old. <laughs> <laughs> I think like over a period of time, there's so much time and encapsulated. Also was, was this technology that you uh, merged with your art, uh, how did that, w was that taught to you? Were you exposed to that in any way at school? Well, um, no, not really. I have, I've always <laughs> been a math person. I've liked math. I think of math as something like in the background, a very significant part of who I am. And I think that ability to, to be excited about a problem, to look at how things work, to, to kind of understand, unravel, that's how I, I see art, for me, has been, a, has, has been a means of unraveling discovery, self, around me. So I think of that in a very, in that applicable manner, like it's an application also. But in terms of um, the first animation or the first uh, interface with technology was 2000, 2001. So some of the older animations are, are pretty Yeah, I was just going to say, <laughs> lame. You know, your familiarity with technology has evolved with technology itself. itself. 
And even now, the last post compared to the 4K work at the, currently at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and that's just six years, and how much the technology has changed. So I think that, at least to me, looking at all of the history of your animation, you've really pressed the boundaries of what can you do with this technology with vis-a-vis -vis its relationship yeah, to and, drawing. And also when I got a chance to uh, do all the billboards in Times Square, mm -hmm. that was the, that was really fantastic for me as, as an artist to see how well um, it fell into place. Not just the iconography, but the but the medium itself on the digital billboards mm -hmm. had a presence. It was, the quality was super good, and it's, um, it made sense there whenever, um, even for the brief minutes that it showed. So that type of like, you know, to test the work mm -hmm. with the state of the art technology, but also it, it had meaning. I thought when the Gopi swarms came at midnight, they were, omnipresent, they had a dark element to them, they demanded attention, and they also, in the experience of them, people, people didn't know what they were. They <coughs> felt like swarms had descended. They were bats at night. Or, and then to really realize, okay, this could have other meaning, and what that meaning may be has another profound effect. And for me, I was testing the longevity of a form. So it's, it's formal, but it's not just only formal either. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I would think of technology, that it shouldn't just take over you know, the, the, the direction of the work. It's just one of the other means. Were you influenced by any major artists? Any? <laughs> <laughs> Many. <laughs> Many. Like I mentioned Goya earlier, for sure, I think... Um, so many, um, like Goya f was very like, when I was, ex when, actually when I was curating an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum here several years ago, I was, um, I, I was looking at, you know, I was looking at Goya through the lens of Safavid painting. <laughs> so it was like juxtapositions which may not necessarily be supported by art history that I never saw in art history books, but that I was curious about all different types of direction. And that's where I feel is that when you create unexpected juxtapositions, it, it gives a life to a tired or exhausted um, idea, or um, it challenges your own assumptions. That's, that's how I see. So I'm very open to all types of work and being inspired by a variety of people and writers and it's all filtering all the time. Um, my background is psychology, so I sort of look at it from a different perspective. How much of this do you attribute to the unconscious? I think I thought you would, it would be good to have somebody else express that. But, um, but in my, like, in, in terms of <laughs> me how as the other person. Conscious? How much of it is conscious and how much of it is that you're a conduit? Okay, I will, I don't know if I should, well, I will express it, but when I was doing the, the work, which is um, at the Philadelphia Art Museum. There's a permanent work of mine which just opened there. It will, it will be up for many, many years. But it's, a, it's an animation, but it is looking at Gulshane Ishk, the manuscript, which, uh, the Smith, uh, with the, which the Philadelphia Museum owns. So when I was looking at the 90 illustrations, the history of that book, and trying to see how I could make a comment on it, how I could use it as a means of inspiration. In there, there's a lot that unfolds, but one little chapter in my interpretation is my, I inserted my dream in it. <laughs> it fell into place, it was so similar. It was like some of the, of the pages I had seen, one at the Met, one elsewhere, then one also in the book itself where, you know, there's hardship and there's like all this danger in the sea. And I had a particular dream for a long time, and it just was like, this, is, this has to go there. So now I can't tell anymore, but you have to go see it. <laughs> but yes, dreams are really, dreams are wonderful things to tap into. To a lay person, which is what I am, not an artist, scientist I am, 
But I'm, I have a, the British soldier you had shown. Are you bringing up some of the history of India and Pakistan and bringing it to the world and, and the, 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 the music which you used or the voices you used, it was that pain of that area? That is the composer. I don't know. Is, do you know? Are you here? Yeah, she's back yeah. there. So, yeah, so that, that the, uh, I worked, I've been working with Duyun, who has composed many scores for different works, but the little glimpse that you saw is, um, uh, she brought that to life. And what I really appreciate so much about working with, um, with Duyun herself is that we both also take tradition and explore it and expand it. We're not afraid of coming from that history. And we're not afraid of, of moving forward. And it's not, for me, it's not linear. It's not like one left, one for something else. It's cyclical. And I think there is that which I embrace, which I think when I think of India, Pakistan, I, it's so complex and layered. And that's how I think in terms of that history, that no matter how many layers you peel off, there are still more to discover. And so that type of density is very profound in how she composes. And that's what I try to do in my work, is to, to create a density, not just through the layers, but the density through, through emotion, the density through keeping the work poorer. So, so how do you make other people you know, interested in your work? As a, as a visual artist, it's a very challenging thing. It's like you make something, and then there's so many ideas in there. How do you make people um, be interested enough to explore that? So there's that, which is an indirect way of referring to the history that one comes from. And in terms of the East India Company, I think it's an incredible, relevant navigational tool to show how all of us are connected. And, and uh, just as one example, um, this particular archetype of the East India Company man, later in another work, which you can also see, he, uh, what I did is I took Adam Smith's portrait and he's dressed in the East India Company attire, but he, he develops wings. So at Princeton's economics building, he's fluttering. <laughs> he's like, because he, he, according to, you know, reading a lot of Nick Robbins, but also really understanding, like, he uses it as a case study. Um, to understand the extreme disparity of, uh, of like, you know, it create harm to people, what, in, what extreme wealth and monopoly of wealth does. And, and when you look at, <laughs> we still are um, dependent on similar patterns of wealth distribution. And so, you know, so, so that would be one way of the iconography traveling in space. And then for me, that it becomes permanently placed in glass at 25 feet at Princeton is another iteration of the form and its ability to locate itself in history. That's what is so exciting is that the form has left um, your mind and your um, little space on paper into something bigger. And that process is full of mystery. Shazia, um, I'm here. So, uh, First of all, congratulations, and thank you for these explanations about some of the stuff that we have been seeing without understanding, but <laughs> appreciating deeply for what it is. Um, my question is very, very simple. When an artist begins to create a work of art, which is, uh, in my understanding, is just a piece of painting or something, uh, the artist probably knows what the person he's, he or she is going to do. But when you create the so-called animations that you are talking about, and you begin with one end, and you know I'm a terrible fan of parallax, and I've been bugging Rachel to organize a show here, and in spite of six months of persistent efforts, it has not happened yet. I hope, Rachel, it will. <laughs> so my question is that when you begin a 15-minute presentation, and you begin at one end, do you know where you're going to end? Uh, 
It's not that simple. It's not that clean. It's not like a beginning and an end. But I think when one is aware of of how to close, when the work seems that you've said what you could and it either needs to um, stop there and perhaps be revisited, but there is a sense of um, of a arc of a story, which I'm aware of. I may take different detours to get there, but it's not completely um, happening, unfolding, you know, with no with no backbone. So, a lot of it is um, as it's moving in digital space. I'm drawing the drawings, so like I can change the drawings to move it in different directions. But also, I think what happens is that when one is, I'm interested in the voice of the composer. I'm interested in the in the elements that poetry as an agency is very interesting for me. So when the poets were contributing and their the the poems they were writing, then those poems had to find space in the work. So then you know all of that's happening simultaneously. So there has to be room to incorporate different languages. And that's what I've, I've been striving with this new sort of multi-channel direction is that how can different languages exist um, independently with their difference, with their autonomy embraced rather than a synthesis of forms. And that, that, that type of um, dissonance that may be there or not, but that's how I, I look at the work is that multiplicity has to exist in its own space and and it can learn to coexist and find its like language with each other but that i that is very much how i see of this work as a collaborative work collaborative not in gesture of who's working in the work but collaborative within the work itself so that's where i i would say that the narrative has to be open enough and yet very precise so that that balance, you can strike that balance. And I think in Parallax, it's really that balance is very well, has succeeded well for multiple reasons. Like, you know, there's, a, there's actually a book coming out on the making of it. We look forward to that book. Thank and meanwhile, you. it seems you have mastered this art of bringing together all these complexities into, complexities into one space. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, Chelsea, more. a quick question. Um, do you identify as an Asian American artist? You were born and raised in Asia, but you've been in America for a long time, over half your life. Um, do you identify as an Asian American artist? And if so, um, what does that mean to you? I thought I, I thought I didn't I answer that question 20 years ago. <laughs> no, I feel like, you know, when I when I got here, I was like, oh, Asia is huge. So when you when growing up in Pakistan, you know, you're you're looking into the West. You're not really that at that time in my experience, we I had not necessarily traveled that much to Asia. So the world has shifted. One's understanding of Asia is is dependent on who we ask, right? So um all of it, all of it, like all those categories I embrace. So when I think of myself, I think of all the various categories from, from being um, myself, from being a Muslim American, Asian American, um, Asian American as an Indian American. I've also been like an Indian American as in Indian, American Indian American, <laughs> depending on where I was. I, you know, so it's like it's so fluid. What I think is so essential about identity is that the minute you say you're that, it's invalid and it's fluid and it's changing and it's shifting and it's moving and you can never um, you can never uh, make frame it into any authentic space the, the minute you seek authenticity I think that's when it fails you and um, and that's been so beautiful because when you realize that then it's like a collective space it's all about a human identity than just me. Um, hi. Okay. I know you've already touched on this a little bit, but could you talk a little bit about your creative process? Like what actually happens when inspiration hits you? 
Oh, that's a great question because you already said inspiration hits you. When the inspiration hits you, then it's easy. <laughs> Getting inspired is so hard. Getting inspired is, um, I don't know, cannot tell you how that inspiration, but definitely when I'm inspired, there's no stopping. It's like a train that's going and you have so much more energy, you are excited, you are, you're, it's like a childlike curiosity. And that's what I always think is that it's so important to, to instill that in all of us, but in, our younger, in younger children from an early age, that um, curiosity is so essential. And that's the space, so, so precious. Is there one last question? Or no? Well, thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you, Shazia, too, thank for you. this. Thank and you. thank you, everyone.